Is this on? Yeah, it is. Is it on now? Thank you. Good to see all of you this morning. Even with the rain, we need the rain. Good to see all of you. We are uh, here at uh, Van Church uh, to uh, worship uh, our Father. And uh, we want to welcome all of you. Uh, those of you that are visiting, we are so happy to have you here. Please don't run out the back door at the end of the service. We'd like to know who you are. And so thank you for being with us and blessing us with your presence. Uh, we hope everybody is well. Um, Van Church is a special place for us. Um, we're we're kind of newbies here, but one of the best things about, one of the things that we like about Van Church is number one is our leaders, uh, our coaches, which are, I, I call them our coaches because they're our ministers, they're good coaches. And the, there's a group of people that I worship with on, on Saturday morning, the men's Bible study. I tell you what, when I get done <laughs> Saturday morning with those men, my, my spirit is high. They're good men. Uh, and then Tuesday morning, the ladies come over to my, our house for, for a while, Bible study with my wife. And that's a kick in the pants, just sit there and listen to those girls talk and, and, and interact with that. And so we're in a good place here. And I, those are just some of the strong Christians uh, and, and faith healers that we have here. I know this whole room is full of you. So we want to welcome all of you uh, here at Van Church. Carl and I are so glad that you all are here. Let's turn our minds to the word of God. 2 Corinthians 4, verses 6 through 12. For God, who said, let light shine out of the darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. We are hard-pressed on every side but not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. For we who are alive are always given over to death for Jesus' sake but that his life may also be revealed in our mortal body. So then, death is at work in us, but life is at work in you. Let's worship this morning. Good morning, good morning, good morning. You get three of them this morning. Uh, if you are somewhat new uh, to the first service, um, you may not have met me yet. My name is Malcolm. Uh, my family and I more often go to the second service, but I love a chance, and I've got a couple of them recently to come to the first service, because, okay, what I say has to stay in this room. Agreed? There's something about the first service, maybe it's that you, you get up earlier, you know, when it's rainy and at least until 
November. Um, it's still like, it's starting to get dark already uh, before the time change and you're, you're up when it's rainy and you're dark. And I don't know if this is okay to say, but it feels more spiritual, does it not? Yes. I'm glad we're in agreement. So again, we agreed this doesn't leave this room, but good on you for being more spiritual than our dear brothers and sisters in the second service. But of course, I'm being facetious, but I'm so glad that you're here. And uh, here we are. Um, whatever kind of week that you've had, uh, whatever kind of morning you're had, you've had, whatever is going on in this season of your life, uh, here we are in this room at this time, uh, worshiping together uh, with the rest of the world, uh, believers around the world this morning. And that's a powerful thing. And we're going to open the word and we're going to hear some hope. And we're going to praise God and turn our focus, our worship, our attention to him this morning for a few minutes. Is that okay? One more thing. Uh, you guys are my worship team. I am not a soloist. Uh, I've never considered myself a soloist. I love leading people in worship. I despise singing solos. So you guys are my worship team. So I'm counting on you to sing out. Agreed to that also? Remember I said you're more spiritual? That means singing out, okay? Let's stand and uh, worship God together. Over all the earth you reign on high, every mountain stream, every sunset sky. But my one request, Lord, my only aim is that you'd reign in me again. Lord, reign in me, reign in your power over all my dreams. In my darkest hour, you are the Lord of all I am. So won't you reign in me again over every thought, over every word. May my life reflect the beauty of my Lord, because you mean more to me than any earthly thing. So won't you reign in me again, Lord, reign in me, reign in your power over all my dreams in my darkest hour you are the Lord of all I am so won't you reign in me again Lord reign in me reign in your power over all my dreams in my darkest hour you are the Lord of all I am, so won't you reign in me again? Christ the Lord is risen today, alleluia. Sons of men and angels say, alleluia. Raise your joys and triumphs high, alleluia. Sing ye heavens and earth reply, Alleluia Lives again our glorious King Alleluia Where, O oh, death, is now thy sting Alleluia Once he died our souls to save Alleluia, where thy victory, O grave, Alleluia, love's redeeming work is done, Alleluia, fought the fight, the battle won, Alleluia. Death in vain forbids him rise, Alleluia. Christ hath opened paradise, Alleluia. 
In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace. When fears are still, when striving cease, my comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. In Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in helpless babe, this gift of love and righteousness scorned by the ones he came to save till on that cross as Jesus died the wrath of God was satisfied for every sin on him was laid here in the death of Christ I live. You can have a seat. As we uh, continue our worship, we give glory to God, always, not just from 9 to 10 on Sunday, 724. Our lives are a light to God, and we give him all glory. We are here now to remember the sacrifice of Jesus and of God so that we can have eternal life. And we will be taking communion. If you have not received your communion elements, they're back there in the back table there if you need to get them. Saturday morning, I, I will, I've already alluded to that. Saturday morning, there's about eight to ten men. One guy is from Arkansas, <laughs> uh, Marvin. And we study, we've been studying the Old Testament Oh, Mona, I'll tell you, it's a lot of mud to walk through. But we just finished the first five books of, of, of the Bible, and we're into now Joshua and Judges. And we keep, we keep re reoccurring the same theme. We all came up to the idea that God is holy. He was trying to get those Israelites to figure out who he was. God is holy, and he wants us to be holy so that he can come into our presence. So this morning, I'd like for you to just encourage you to put away all your distractions. Whatever's happened to you this week, put them on the back burner. And in the next few minutes, concentrate on uh, Jesus Christ and who he was and, what, and how he lived and how we are to, how do we live to be holy? We are not of this world. We are of the Lord. We are of God. We follow his commands. And God wants that to happen because he wants to come into our presence. And so I want to encourage all of you to be holy. So as you partake of the communion this morning, I want you to think about your relationship with God, your personal relationship with God. Where are you there? and how to reach out to him and ask him to help you walk with him. This is a time you can virtual or and walk with him right now and ask him and talk to him and about what your concerns are and, and lay all your things at his feet. He will listen. He wants to be near us. We are his children. So as we take communion this morning, I want you to remember those things. And it's a personal relationship we're all here together as saints, as, as, and our spirits are together. But 
as we are together to encourage one another, this is a time for personal reflection with the Father. So will you bow with me, please? Uh, Father, uh, we give all glory to you. We are so fortunate that we have been led to be your children. We thank you for putting people in our paths to guide us to this place. We all have different stories and different paths that we, that we travel. So Father, we ask for your presence. We ask for you to walk with us. Father, help us to be holy. Help us to be righteous. Thank you so much for your son and what he did for us and for what you did for us. And we, understand, we do not understand the love that you have for us. We do not. But Father, we give you all glory. You are the, you are the God of creation. You are the God of our, of our spirit. And so, Father, we ask that uh, as we partake of the bread and the, and the fruit of the vine, that we reflect upon you and what is going on in our lives and hand all things over to you. Help us not to think of anything of the world, but think of the spiritual way that we are to be here. Father, we pray these things through your son's name. Amen. There in the ground his body lay, light of the world by darkness slain. Then bursting forth in glorious day, up from the grave he rose again. And as he stands in victory, since curse has lost its grip on me, for I am his and he is mine, bought with the precious blood of Christ. No guilt in life, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns or calls me home. Here in the power of Christ I'll stand till he returns or calls me home. Here in the power of Christ I'll stand. God sent his son. They called him Jesus. He came to love, heal and forgive. He bled and died to buy my pardon. An empty grave is there to prove my Savior lives. Let's stand and sing. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know he holds the future. And life is worth the living just because he lives. How sweet to hold a newborn baby and feel the pride and joy he gives.
is, but greater still the calm assurance this child can face uncertain days because Christ lives, because he lives. I can face tomorrow because he lives. All fear is gone because I know he holds the future and life is worth the living just he lives and then one day I'll cross that river I'll fight life's fine no war with pain and then as death gives way to victory I'll see the lights of glory and I'll know he reigns because he lives I can face tomorrow because he lives all fear is gone because I know he holds the future and life is worth the living just because he lives and life is worth the living just because he lives amen and you can have a seat Good morning. Do you remember your first car? I knew some of you would laugh at that. For some of you, you're laughing because that was a few solar cycles ago. And others of you are laughing because of what the car was. When I got my first car, um, I looked around, as I think people are prone to do, at the cars that my friends were driving. And I had all kinds of ideas of what kind of car that I would love to have. My friend Justin got a 1993 Honda Prelude. It looked like this. I mean, that still looks like a great car, doesn't it? And uh, this would have been in 1996 when I started driving. I'm sorry for how that makes some of you feel. Uh, my friend Keith probably had the vehicle that I would have most liked to have for myself. It was a black Jeep, a uh, CJ7 uh, that looked something like that. My best friend Gary had a Z71 Silverado Chevy pickup with a lift kit and hunting lights, that's not his, but his looked very close to that. It also had two sets of 15 inch subwoofers behind the back seat. And um, I probably did lasting damage to my hearing in that truck. And now here's my, here was my car, my first car. The 1980 Ford LTD. That LTD stands for limited for those who are uh, unacclimated. One time I was at, in a construction zone at a four-way stop, a lot of stopping and going. The car had no FM radio, so I had a little battery-operated FM radio that ran, um, that sat there in the seat. And the, the truck in front of me, it was a cable repair truck, great big one, um, stopped short a little bit, and I had to slam on my brakes. And that radio rolled into the floorboard, and so um, I watched, you know, I was being careful, and, and I was like, I got to pick that up. And so I, I lean over, and I pick it up. 
up, and as I do so, my, my foot came off the brake. And I, at idle speed, my Ford LTD ran into the back of that cable pickup truck and bent the bumper of the truck up underneath the tailgate. And mine had a tiny little scratch right on the point of the, the car there. It was a tank. The headliner and the ceiling was falling down and the, the outer later had fallen down and there was just the foam left under there and you could write things in the foam and it would stay there forever. And so my friends would write things and I'd be like, now I have to carve out that whole part of the car because of what you wrote up there. Um, the passenger seat belt in the front seat was broken, but the middle one worked just fine. And so I used this to my advantage if I was um, carrying friends and there was a particular female that I was interested in. I'd be like, oh, well, that seat belt's broken, um, but you can share. I would have to move my seat belt all the way over and clip in the middle one. And so we'd have to share a seat belt. It was just a, a price that someone had to pay. And so it's for safety. This car... My car is in a junkyard somewhere, probably in Texas. That's what cars do. They break, they decay, they rust. Now imagine that I told you that a day is going to come when I get a call from the junkyard. And they tell me that something extraordinary has happened to my car. You've got to get down here and see this because you're not going to believe what has happened. And when I arrived, the manager of the junkyard takes me out to the back and he said, we just can't explain it. But a master mechanic came in and did some work on your car and here is your car now. <laughs> Same beautiful baby blue color. A little bit of an upgrade. How is this possible? Well, he took all the pieces and all of the parts and all of the materials and he, in his master craftsmanship, he took it all apart and stripped it all down and used his skill and maybe even a little bit of magic and refashioned all of it, all of those raw materials back into this. And even more amazing than all of that is that it has a completely different kind of engine now. One that will not break down, one that doesn't run on gasoline anymore. It's powered in a new kind of way, a power that is safe and clean and unlimited. And then he says this, this car will last forever. It sounds ridiculous, right? But what I've just described is almost exactly our Christian hope of the resurrection of the dead. We believe in the resurrection of the dead. Many Christians today have the mistaken and unbiblical notion that what awaits us in the end is some sort of non-body experience floating around as disembodied spirits, a non-material, ethereal, wispy, non-physical, spiritual existence somewhere else. And this mistaken notion believes that God is gonna take everything on this planet, our bodies, everything that God has made, and he's going to throw all of it in some sort of cosmic trash bin or junkyard and that only our souls will remain. But that's not what we believe. What I've said about the car is also true about us. God isn't going to scrap it all. Instead, God is going to take what is and transform it into something that is powered no longer just by physical existence. He's going to take our bodies. We will be raised to new life, raised with bodies. God's going to take all that is that's powered by just physical existence at this point, and he is going to upgrade it and transform it so that it is powered forever with his life animating spirit. That's what we believe. 
We believe that Jesus Christ has been raised from the dead. And one day, those who are in Christ will also be raised from the dead with new resurrection bodies. And as some of you creak and turn and pop and stretch in that chair of yours, you say hallelujah. <laughs> Love that old song. Uh, one glad morning uh, when all the dead in Christ shall rise. I'll have a new body, praise the Lord, I'll have a new life. I listened to about 15 different versions of that song this week. It just wouldn't get out of my head. And this isn't a minor issue. Some may say, well, does it really matter what we believe on this? I mean, isn't there some room here on this? And I would say, and I rarely say this about anything, you know me well enough by now to know that I rarely say something this absolute, but it absolutely matters that we believe Almost exactly, I may have some of the wording wrong here, but the concept under the wording, I think it matters that we believe this truth. Because if this isn't true, then everything about the Christian faith is worthless and false and a waste of time. Not just that Jesus Christ has been raised from the dead. I mean, Paul says that in 1 Corinthians. If Christ hasn't been raised from the dead, then your faith is futile and this is a waste of time. He basically says that, right? And it's not only that, that Jesus Christ has been raised from the dead with a body, but that we also will be raised. We believe in the resurrection of the dead. And I believe that that matters so much that without it, everything about the Christian faith falls apart. Who you are how you live, how you treat other people, how you live on this planet, what you devote your life to and your time to and your energy to and your vocation to and your energy to, all of that is shaped by what you believe about this and how we understand salvation and what we're actually hoping for through Christ is shaped by this belief as well. So with that in mind, we're going to look at resurrection today and what we believe about it and why it matters. The first thing that we'll say about resurrection is that resurrection affirms that creation is good. In Genesis chapter one, creation is good and God consistently affirms it. In Genesis one, starting in verse 31, we're just gonna read this one verse. After God had made everything, it says this, God saw all that God had made, and it was very good. I think I've got the wrong words up there, but Genesis 131, God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. The second thing to say about resurrection is that it matters that Jesus had a body. That matters. In John chapter one, verse 14, it says, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father full of grace and truth. Jesus chose to become one of us. He chose to have a body. And that matters a lot because a lot of people think that matter is evil and that only spiritual stuff counts. That physicality and our bodies and the world and dirt and air and water and all of those things, those things are part of a fallen system, a fallen planet, and it's all gonna be scrapped, it's all gonna be thrown in the trash, and so it's evil. And so our job is to escape, to get away from that and to focus on spiritual things. Those ideas aren't new. They've been around for thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of years, that's five thousands because I know, we know historically at least that, and this is called Gnosticism in the Greek worldview because of this idea that you, you get, you're really after special knowledge, not the redemption of all life, you're really just after special knowledge that gives you the key to something eternal. And we still struggle with Gnosticism here in the 21st century in the West and even in the church because we, we experience brokenness with our bodies. We find it difficult to believe that God has good things in store for this. Our bodies are intimately connected with mistakes that we have made. 
in rebellion against God. Our bodies are a reminder that we are flawed and broken. Most of us experience at least some level of shame associated with our bodies. So the temptation to want to be rid of our bodies and to just go on existing in some more pure or spiritual form is a tempting idea that many of us wrestle with. But even though we suffer in our body, God affirms the goodness of our bodies by choosing to have one himself. And if it's good enough for God to have one of these, then who are we to say that ours doesn't matter? By becoming like us in every way, Jesus affirms that what God has created is good and worth God giving everything to save it. And that brings us to Jesus' resurrection body. Jesus, when he conquered death and rose from the grave, Jesus was raised with a body and still has a body. When When Jesus ascended, he didn't turn into like a ghost. He still had his resurrection body and he's alive now and he will return as we'll talk about next week. He has his resurrection body. In Luke chapter 24, starting in verse 38, after he was raised from the dead, Jesus appears to his disciples. And it says this, he said to them, why are you troubled? Why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself, touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and feet. And while they still did not believe it because of joy and amazement, he asked them, do you have anything to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish and he took it and ate it in their presence. I'm pretty sure that's Jesus's way of saying, look, I'm, I'm really here and if, if you need some proof, I'm pretty sure that ghosts don't eat fish and so if you wanna watch, I'm gonna eat this and if it drops through, then I'm a ghost. And of course it didn't. Not only was Jesus raised with a physical of some kind, physical resurrection body, it also retained his scars. In John chapter 20, verse 27 and 28, it says, then he said to Thomas, put your finger here. See my hands, reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. Jesus, even in victory, kept his scars. And we'll come back to that later. The next thing to say about resurrection is that not only was Jesus raised with a body, but we also will be raised with bodies. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 2, John writes, Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we will see him as he is. We don't know what all that will entail, what it will all be like, but we know that when we see Jesus, we will be like him. Jesus has a body. We also will have a resurrection body. In Philippians chapter three, verse 20 and 21, Paul writes, but our citizenship is in heaven and we eagerly await a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lonely bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. Then in Romans chapter eight, verse 10 and 11, Paul writes there, but if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, 
He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit who lives in you. And then in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 42 through 44, Paul writes, so will it be with the resurrection of the dead. The body that is sown perishable, it is raised imperishable. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. We will be raised with bodies. And that's good news. Next, the resurrection indicates that God, that God's redemption and God's restoration involves all of creation, not just immaterial spiritual stuff, but also material physical stuff. Again, to Romans chapter eight. I hope it's okay that we are in scripture a lot this morning. Romans chapter eight, verse 18 through 23. Paul writes, I consider that our present sufferings, and let's just pause. We have some present sufferings, yes? I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the sons and daughters of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the spirit, we groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. All of creation is longing for redemption and resurrection. And what that verse says, I think, is that all of creation is looking right now at us, longing for God to reveal that we are in fact God's sons and daughters because that will be the sign to creation that creation itself can hope for full redemption and restoration one day. Not to forever be this chaotic planet that in some ways creates and gives life and in other ways destroys and is chaotic and difficult. Our hope isn't so much so that it's for us to leave this place and go somewhere else. Instead, God is bringing his kingdom, the kingdom of heaven, God is bringing it to earth. Listen, I I don't exactly know what that all means. I know that a lot of us grew up with this idea that, that one day this all, this all goes away and we go somewhere else. We take some sort of cosmic bus. If you've read C.S. Lewis's uh, The Great Divorce, we get on a bus and we go to heaven somewhere else. And at least it appears that way. But that's not what scripture says. Scripture says in Revelation chapter 21 that instead of us escaping to some other place, heaven is gonna come here to us and heaven and earth will no longer be distinct realities, but they will be one place. Revelation 21 verse one, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and will be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. 
This changes how we think about salvation. Salvation is not about getting out of here. It's about God restoring all things. Consider what author N.T. Wright says. If it's true that God is going to transform this present world and renew our whole selves, bodies included, then what we do in the present time with our bodies and with our world matters. If there is continuity between who and what we are in the present and who and what we will be in the future, we cannot discount the present life, the present body, and the present world as irrelevant. That means that what we do now, who we are becoming now, stretches into eternity. If you knew you were going to live forever, what kind of person would you start becoming today? Resurrection also changes the way we see people. People are not just souls to be saved, but whole persons to be nurtured and cared for. That's why people's physical needs matter and not just their souls. That's why the, the whole debate in Christianity in the West at the beginning of the 20th century, 100 years ago, the churches and denominations split over all over the place of, well, it's, the church is about saving souls. No, it's about physical needs and justice and restoring the social order on earth. It's, you know, and all I start to hear as I hear that is that old um, beverage commercial. Great taste, less filling, great taste, less filling. I mean, can we move past that? And recognize that both of those things matter immensely to God. Saving our hearts, our souls, and our bodies. It all matters now. It all matters later. That's why justice for everyone matters now. Because the way the new creation is, and the way the new creation is going to be forever is not how this world currently is now. And so we are invited to seek justice so that the world might become more and more like it will be when resurrection comes. Resurrection changes how we see the physical world and the environment. If we believe that God is going to discard all of this then trashing, exploiting, and ravaging the planet's resources isn't a big deal. But if we believe that God is going to restore and redeem all of this into his new creation, then we're invited to begin living that way now. And so what we do now matters. It's not in vain because death will be defeated once and for all. What we do in the present has meaning. In 1 Corinthians 15, verse 58, Paul concludes that great chapter on resurrection this way. He said, therefore, my brothers, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. He doesn't say those words at the end of a chapter about pulling yourselves up by your bootstraps or trying to create utopia on earth or us just trying to get the right people elected or trying to get the wrong people out of being elected. No, he says that at the end of his, his full chapter of resurrection and how in the resurrection of the dead, in the resurrection of the righteous and the restoration of all things, God is going to redeem and restore and so what we do now, it's not in vain. It counts. It matters. I read a short story recently by an author named Sherman Alexi who wrote a story called What You Pawn, I Will Redeem. And I want to share parts of it. These aren't meant to be direct quotes if you're familiar with the story, but the Mark's paraphrase. It tells the story of a Native American man named Jackson who is navigating homelessness in Seattle when one day he and his friends are walking down the street and they pass in front of a pawn shop. 
Jackson looks, and there hanging in the window of the pawn shop is an old woman's powwow dance regalia outfit, with beads and tassels. It's stunning. Jackson looks through the window and then looks at his friends and says, that's my grandmother's powwow regalia. How do you know for sure? I don't know for sure because I haven't actually seen that regalia in person ever. I've only seen photographs of my grandmother dancing in it. And those were taken before someone stole it from her 50 years ago. But it sure looks like my memory of it. And it has all the same color feathers and beads that my family sewed into our powwow regalia. There's only one way to know for sure. And so Jackson and his friends entered the pawn shop and greeted the old man working behind the counter. How can I help you? The owner asked. That's my grandmother's powwow regalia in your window, Jackson said. Somebody stole it from her 50 years ago, and my family has been searching for it ever since. The pawn shop owner looked at this homeless man at like, and looked at him like he was a liar. Pawn shops are often filled with liars. I'm not lying, Jackson said. All right, honest Indian, the pawnbroker said, I'll give you the benefit of the doubt. Can you prove it's your grandmother's regalia? Well, because they don't want to be perfect, because only God is perfect, Indian people sew flaws into their powwow regalia. My family always sewed one yellow bead somewhere on our regalia, but we always hid it so that you had to search really hard to find it. If it's really my grandmother's, there will be one yellow bead hidden somewhere on it. All right, then, the pawnbroker said, let's take a look. So he pulled down the regalia out of the window, laid it down on the glass counter, and they searched for the yellow bead and found it hidden, sewn beneath the armpit. There it is, the pawnbroker said. He didn't sound surprised. You, you were right. This must be your grandmother's regalia. It's been missing for 50 years, Jackson said. Are you going to give it back? Well, that would be the right thing to do, the pawnbroker said, but I can't afford to do the right thing. I paid $1,000 for this. I can't just give away $1,000. The pawnbroker sighed. He was thinking about the possibilities. What's your name? Jackson. All right, Jackson, the pawnbroker said. You wouldn't happen to have $1,000, would you? We've got $5 total, Jackson said. Well, that's too bad. I'd sell it to you for $1,000 if you had it. Hey, to make it fair, I'd sell it to you for $999. I'd lose a dollar. That'd be the moral thing to do in this case. To lose a dollar would be the right thing. Well, I've got $5 total, Jackson said. That's too bad, he said once more. And he thought harder about the possibilities. How about this? I'll give you 24 hours to come up with $999. And you come back here at lunchtime tomorrow and the money, and I'll sell it back to you. How does that sound? It sounds all right, Jackson said. Okay, we have a deal, and I'll get you started. Here's 20 bucks. He opened up his wallet, pulled out a crisp $20 bill, and gave it to Jackson, who walked out into the daylight to search for 974 more dollars. And over the next 24 hours, Jackson tries to raise the $999 to redeem his grandmother's regalia, but instead of making good financial decisions, he just... He just keeps encountering people who have stories, who have specific needs. And so he'll make some money and then he'll end up encountering someone and he'll give the money to them. He makes some more money and then he finds some guys who haven't eaten in three days. And so he takes them to a diner and they all eat breakfast. On and on and on this goes through different situations. Sometimes he makes good, heartfelt and loving decisions that help others. And other times he makes foolish decisions and the money is lost. But the result is that 24 hours later, he walks back into the pawn shop, woefully short of the needed funds. He walks back inside, greets the pawnbroker. It's you, he said. Yes, it's me. Do you have the money? How much money do you need again? Hoping the price had changed. $999, he said. It was still the same price. Of course, it was the same price. What? Why would that change? I don't have that, he said. What do you have? Five dollars. Jackson set the crumpled bill with the face of Lincoln on the countertop. The pawnbroker studied it. 
Is that the same $5 from yesterday? No, it's different. He thought about the possibilities. Did you work hard for this money, he asked. Yes, I said. He closed his eyes and thought harder about the possibilities, and then he stepped back into the back room and returned with Jackson's grandmother's regalia. Take it, he said. I don't have the money. I don't want your money. But I wanted to win it back. You did win it. Now take it before I change my mind. He made all the wrong moves. He blew it over and over and he didn't have the money. But in the end, the pawnbroker took Jackson's meager crumpled $5 and all the failure and mistakes that it represented and he redeemed it to give him back his story and his identity. That's what God is going to do in the resurrection of the dead. We will come empty-handed with lives and bodies full of failure and hurt, brokenness, not enough, poor decisions, and falling short. And God will look at us, and rather than giving us what we deserve, he will restore our identity. We will offer him our broken lives and he will hand us who we were truly meant to be all along. Because we believe in the resurrection. Not just of Jesus. We believe that God raises dead things to life. And so all of your stories will not go to waste. Remember, Jesus kept his scars. What he suffered was not forgotten or wiped away or neglected or disregarded in his resurrection. Instead, it was transformed. In the resurrection, God is going to take all our wounds and scars and he's going to redeem them. So whatever you're going through, you may want to be rid of it. But rest assured that because of Jesus... God is going to transform those scars into something beautiful. Nothing will be wasted. And in God's new creation, those scars will be signs of God's victory. That he can bring dead things to life. Again and again. May those who have ears to hear, hear the good news of the resurrection. Let's sing one more song. Let's stand together as we close. I know that my Redeemer lives and ever prays for me. I know eternal life he gives from sin and sorrow free. I know, I know that my Redeemer lives. I know, I know eternal life he gives. I know, I know that my Redeemer lives. He wills that I should wholly be in word and thought. Indeed, then I his holy face may see when from this earth life freed. I know, I know that my Redeemer lives. I know, I know eternal life he gives. I know, I know that my Redeemer lives. 
I know that unto sinful man his saving grace is nigh. I know that he will come again to take me home on high. I know, I know that my Redeemer lives. I know, I know eternal life he gives. I know, I know that my Redeemer lives. Amen. Quick. Um, we are... Um, going to dismiss shortly. We have a box at the back table um, where you can leave an offering or you can give online at vanchurch.org on our website. Um, and we uh, hope that you'll participate as we do all together each week uh, in the sharing of resources uh, for the furthering of God's mission in this place. Also, I want to remind you that next Sunday, October 31st, uh, we are having a trunk or treat event for our community, our neighborhood, our children, both at Van Church, Bright Beginnings, children in our neighborhood, and anyone that you want to invite, they are welcome. Right out here in our parking lot. It'll be from 5.30 to 7.30 p.m. We hope that you'll invite your friends. There are two ways that you can help. You can host a trunk, uh, which means that you'll decorate. It can be simple. You decorate the inside of your trunk. Pop it open and you can stand there. If you want to dress up, you can. It's not required. Um, but bring your own individually wrapped candy. And it, I, was, I forgot to say this the last couple of weeks. It needs to be enough. We anticipate having about 200 kids come through, okay? And so um, if you can bring candy uh, for that, that would be helpful. And if we run out, we will have some extra candy on hand to supplement that. Sign-up sheets for hosting a trunk are at the coffee uh, counter and out at the welcome desk in the lobby, and I hope that you'll sign up. We're looking for a few more and would love for you to come. Also, another way you can help is you can just bring bags of candy, uh, of individually wrapped candy, and put them in the bin in the lobby shelf right over here by the water fountain on this side. Um, it's going to be a great event. We're excited about it. Also, after that, not trying to get too far ahead, but after that, we will be anticipating a special Thanksgiving season in November. And one of the ways that we are going to try to live out our calling and mission is to partner with families in our area through our school system um, to give out some Thanksgiving food boxes to some families who are struggling to make ends meet right now. Van Church families are asked to fill a complete food box. The boxes will be provided. Um, or if you want, you can team up with another family and fill the box together. Starting this Sunday, October 24th, flyers will be available in the lobby with more details. Another way you can help is through donating money towards this ministry. You can put a donation in the box. Is it a separate box or the same box? Is Cherry here? Is it the same box or are there two boxes? It's a separate box. Okay, thank you. I, I thought that that was the case. I wanted to make sure I understood that right. That you can put a donation back there and that will also help um, us gather the resources needed for, uh, those, for those boxes. Um, or you can donate online through our website at vanchurch.org by going to the giving page and by clicking on the benevolence fund choice and it'll direct you from there. November 14th, we're asking people to bring your items to be put in the boxes on November 21st. Uh, at 10 a.m., we will have a combined service celebration to celebrate uh, participating in this together and what God is doing in us and through us and celebrating this, this Thanksgiving season ahead. And after that service, we are going to have a pie potluck. Praise Jesus. More details on that will be coming. Stay tuned. We hope you'll plan to be part of both of these wonderful events that impact our community and help us live out our mission to be Jesus' hands and feet in the world. And now may the grace of God go with you this week. May he give you courage and boldness to live like him in this world. 
with the hope of the resurrection and that what we do is not in vain. We're dismissed. love.